I'm going to present a summary of a chapter that is published here. Um, and this is the book that is coming out. Uh, I'm saying this for two reasons. One is the obvious reason, it's a self-promotion, as the book that I'm editing. But the other reason is that if some things might seem just like as a, you know, a bunch of ideas put together, uh, it's because I deleted all the arguments that are in the chapter. So I promise you, there are arguments supporting these ideas in the chapter, uh, and if you want to hear about them, we can talk about it in the Q&A, or you can read the chapter there. So, um, the starting point for this discussion is a claim um, made within uh, environmental humanities uh, about the fact that the current discourse on the Anthropocene and the climate crisis and the climate catastrophe um, is eschatological. So what that basically means is that um, the way we talk about climate change, uh, what we presuppose there is an idea of time and history that is taken from Christian eschatology. So what I mean by eschatology is basically uh, Christian teachings about the end of the world. So people like Del Froth make a claim that when we talk about the Anthropocene, uh, we usually talk about it in a linear way, ending with some sort of a big cataclysmic event, which is exactly what we get uh, when you read biblical accounts of the end of the world. Right? Good linear time, starting with creation, going through revelation, and ending with the final event or the eschaton. So basically the idea here is that uh, without knowing this, our discussion of climate change is uh, indebted to religion and specifically to an understanding of history um, taken from Christianity. And it's an understanding of history that is uh, specifically, and this is the problem that I'm going to talk about, a single unidirectional line tending towards an end. Right? So you've got a single line, history is a single line ending with some sort of a big event, whether it's a climate catastrophe, uh, extinction event, or Jesus coming back, right? That's the idea. Um, so this is problematic from a decolonial perspective for two reasons. So the first reason is that focusing too much on uh, current climate crisis or on future climate catastrophe blinds us to, any possi to uh, the ends of the world or to ecocide or to climate crisis experienced in the past mostly by colonized communities, right? So our obsession with what's going to happen next, um, our obsession with the future climate crisis makes us unable to account for, or you just basically think it's irrelevant, uh, all the things that happened to colonized communities. So people like uh, Danowski and Viviros de Castro, for example, talk about the fact that the end of the world has already happened in Latin America when Columbus discovered, um, uh, discovered the land, right? Because when Columbus discovered the land, uh, he also brought within himself, obviously, all the terrible things like genocide and ecocide. So when we want to think about climate catastrophe, we should recognize the fact that it's already happened to some people. So this is the first problem, right? If we're focusing too much on the future catastrophe, we completely ignore uh, the suffering, the past suffering of colonized communities. The second problem is, uh, related to this idea of a single timeline. So if you think of um, the Anthropocene and history as uh, a single timeline moving towards an end that is shared by all of humanity, this generates a false sense of universalism, right? That creates a sense of uh, we all live together, it's a common destiny of the whole of humanity, and we need to all need to stop it, right? So that's the kind of idea behind all this COP events, the whole of human kind of, all the human leaders come together to do something about a shared problem. But a lot of people have pointed out that this is a problematic way of thinking because, again, it obscures or conceals the differentiation of climate crisis that is unequal, right? So people from the global south experience the climate crisis more than people from the global north. Part of it is obviously geographical, but part of it is related to imperialist practices, right? So poorer countries, um, poorer as a result of the history of imperialism, uh, are less prepared, have less resources to, to deal with climate change, um, and also are more affected than, uh, than countries in the global north, right? So the second problem is that the single line creates a false universalism that again makes us unable to account for how um, climate crisis is differentiated across the globe, right? So two problems. We forget the end of the world in the past, 
Um, and we also are unable to account for this differentiation. So this is the issue with the sort of eschatological thinking about uh, the Anthropocene. Now, I actually believe uh, that apocalyptism and eschatological tradition is a helpful way to think about the climate crisis, uh, not for any religious reasons, uh, but because I think conceptually, I think there is something about thinking about the apocalypse that I think is very, very useful for us in terms of dealing with the current crisis. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm tr going to try to defend the eschatological tradition or the apocalyptic tradition from these two problems. So I'm going to say that actually it's possible to reread apocalyptic tradition in such a way that um, it doesn't run into two of these two, these two problems, right? So if we read it correctly, I claim, uh, we will be able to account both for past tense of the world and for this differentiation um, that takes place um, in terms of thinking about kind of uh, global distribution of climate uh, crisis. So I'm going to talk about two different, I call them shapes of time because I'm trying to make it sound cool, but really just two different epistemological models of thinking about history. So the first model uh, I reconstruct on the basis of two apocalyptic thinkers. So one is a 20th century monk, uh, Joachim of Fiore, here on the left, and the other one is a 20th century Jewish thinker called Jacob Taubes. And so what they have in common, and I think that's, that's quite interesting, is that they don't think, and they're apocalyptic by the way, they don't think about time as a line. They think about the time as a spiral. Um, so when you look at uh, Joachim um, and Joachim's work, uh, he's most famous for two things. One is his illustrations, uh, which already we get sort of a spiral sense of history happening here. But the other one is um, the division of history into three different stages of three different eras. Uh, so we have an era of the father dominated by the events of the Old Testament, uh, era of the son, which are related to the history of Christianity, and then we've got an era to come, which is the era of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and the era of the Holy Spirit is, according to Joachim, uh, marked by an overcoming of the domination of the Catholic Church and the Catholic law, and a creation of communities of monasteries where we all live kind of communally without the law uh, in these sort of cooperatives. So very kind of anarcho-communist. By the way, um, just a side note, this division of history into three is super influential. Uh, so the way we think about um, you know, ancient times, Middle Ages, and modernity, for example, can be traced to Joachim. The way we, um, well, Marxism thinks about the relationship between feudalism, uh, capitalism, and communism can be traced to Joachim. The way that August Comte thinks about the theological era, the metaphysical era, and the positive era are all indebted to uh, this jo Joachimite, I guess that's the, maybe that's not the right adjective. Anyway, his division of history into three. But um, the important thing is that the reason why Joachim is sort of anticipating this new era is because he believes that history is structured in such a way that events happening in the New Testament, so in the era of the sun, parallel or repeat events and, and people that take place in the era, um, uh, era of the Father. So perhaps those of you who attend the church might be familiar. I mean, some priests talk about it, I guess, um, with the fact that um, the binding of Isaac and the attempt to kill Isaac by Abraham uh, somehow prefigures what's going to happen to Jesus where God is trying to sacrifice his own son, right? So there's this relationship of resemblance, or to put it uh, technically concordance, between what's happening in the Old Testament and what's happening in the New Testament. Now, Joachim is saying that not only is it the case between New Testament and Old Testament, but it can also help us to anticipate something happening in the future, right? So we are in the era of the Son, we are looking back at the era of the Father, finding some patterns, and these patterns allow us to then anticipate what's happening in the future. So we've got this spiral movement here, where the parallel between this and this allows us to anticipate this, right? So it's not a line going from point A to point B, or from a beginning of creation to the end, but rather is this repetition of meaning that takes place there. So it's actually a spiral movement that allowed us to anticipate the shape of the new post-apocalyptic era. Okay, I hope this is clear. The point is that it's a spiral. That's the, that's the main point. Now, Taubes, it's, uh, you know, fast forward um, almost a millennium. We get Taubes, he writes this book in the uh, late 1940s, 
Um, and it's a history of apocalypticism. And in, when you first read it, it's got this structure that is very linear. linear um, and it starts with uh, ancient apocalypticism, then goes through Middle Ages, and then ends with Hegel, Kierkegaard, and Marx as uh, modern apocalyptics. Uh, but what you actually find out, as you read the book, that Taubes makes these connections between certain events and certain characters uh, happening at different stages, right? So for example, Hegel and Kierkegaard repeat certain things we find in St. Paul, right? So again, what we have here is that, you know, the kind of the present, let's call it, I mean, Hegel and Kierkegaard are not our, you know, uh, contemporaries, but if we think about modernity, Hegel and Kierkegaard are our contemporaries, they repeat something from the ancient world, and importantly, at the end of Occidental Eschatology, uh, Taubes has this very cryptic and crazy idea about the future of eschatology. So what he does actually is he goes Hegel, Kierkegaard, St. Paul, and then the future of eschatology again. So when you look at the structure of his analysis, the structure again is spiral, right? We start with something happening now, then we look uh, at the parallels in, in the past, and then we anticipate the future, right? So it's a spiral, spiral movement again. Now, the reason why this is relevant, apart from the fact that I think, I mean, I think it's pretty cool that, you know, there are these kind of patterns everywhere, and yeah, anyway, but that's just me. There is a reason why I think this is relevant. Uh, the, the reason why is that it allows us to answer the first problem, right? So the first problem was that focusing too much on the future climate disaster makes us unable to recognize the past at some ends of the world, right? So our view becomes Western-centric, Eurocentric, because we are thinking about uh, only what is going to affect us without recognizing what happened in the past to people outside of um, uh, the Northern Hemisphere. But if we think about time as a spiral, history as a spiral, um, even if this spiral ends somewhere with some sort of an apocalyptic event, we can recognize precisely this past stuff, right? So what we can say is that our understanding of the future, climate catastrophe, has to pass through an analysis of the current crisis, which has to be oriented by the parallels with the past crises, right? So what we get here is, remember, we start with the present. So let's, let's go back here. Start with the present, see parallels with the past, and then anticipate the future. I think we can do the same thing with the climate disaster. When we start with the present, analyze the past, so the past ends of the world, to then anticipate the shape of the end of the world to come. And as a result of that, we can, I think, devise certain political ways of mitigating that or appropriating that or changing it to our own will, precisely because we've done this analysis of the comparison between the present, the past, which allows us to anticipate the future. So I think that this uh, uh, addresses the first problem uh, because it does recognize uh, the past ends of the world. Now, moving to the second problem. Um, Remember, the second problem was the fact that this sort of single universal timeline uh, basically um, creates a false universalism which pretends like we all knit together and basically uh, makes us, again, unable to recognize the differentiation of climate crisis uh, related to power dynamics within the context of global, um, global imperialism. Um, and actually, the spiral history in Joachim and Taubes are both guilty of doing that, right? Because they're both uh, operate with one timeline. So even if the timeline is spiral, if it's one, one timeline, this one timeline is universal, and therefore it necessarily uh, obscures all the differentiation that takes place when we think about the climate crisis. But I think uh, that when we think about the apocalypse, we can think about it in terms of multiple timelines. It's not just one timeline. So um, the first way to think about it is to think about it in terms of what I call an existential timeline. So basically a timeline related to individuals. Um, so for example, a, an apocalyptic prophet, someone who has a vision that the end is about to, uh, the, the world is about to end, has an individual experience which has its own structure and its own timeline um, that will be different to experiences of other people. So very often when you read about these apocalyptic prophets, they are differentiated from other people precisely because of this different experience of time. And so when we think about it, we can say that they have a sort of an apocalyptic experience of time, which would be individual and different to the rest of the community. 
Well, I think we can also think about it, excuse me, think about it in terms of, mm, in terms of um, metaphorical end of the world, right? So very often we experience traumatic events uh, that we can you know, call world shattering, right? Certain, certain things happen to us that seem like you know, the world as we know it um, is no longer the way it used to be and things have to change or at the time we feel like things um, are unable to move forward and so on. And I think in this situation we can also talk about a sort of existential uh, apocalyptic timeline even if it's only metaphorical. That's the first level. The second level uh, would be a sort of level um, of history or historiography. historiography. Um, and that would be the level where we think about the end of the world in terms of historical events. So again, it could be a, um, an actual apocalypse, right? So, you know, actually, Jesus coming back and doing something in Poland, for example. Um, or it could be an event that we can call metaphorically an apocalypse, um, which would be something like, I don't know, war, um, a financial crisis, um, and yeah, anything. I think there's a lot of stuff about the apocalypse happening after the First World War because the events of the First World War seem to a lot of people um, like a type of an apocalypse. So th those sort of things then become apocalyptic as well, but obviously they're on a different level than the existential time. So we have a second level, this sort of time of history, and the third level is a cosmological, um, cosmological timeline. So here, again, it will be very different uh, kind of approaches, but what they have in common is that they assume a sort of extra human perspective. So a perspective um, which would be more than human. So, you know, you can read a religious text that talks about the beginning and the end of the universe. That would be a cosmological perspective. You can read some philosophical texts that explore the consequences of the fact that at one point the sun is going to die and there will no longer be any heat in the universe and all of life will disappear again. That's the cosmological timeline. Or you can think about, you know, the dinosaurs dying. That's also a cosmological timeline in my reading. But the point is that there are very different ways of thinking about the end of the world, which actually split this apocalyptic temporality into at least three levels. And if that is the case, um, then I think we can ask, what is the relationship between this, these different timelines? So I'm actually drawing here on a guy called Althusser, who is not an apocalyptic. He's a Marxist, French Marxist. Um, who's not the nicest guy, uh, he actually had a, um, he had a psychotic, psychotic attack and he killed his wife. Um, but, I mean, there is no very bad movie from there, but I wanted to spread it out there in case you find out about it, like, why is this guy talking about a like, wife murderer? I'm not talking about him as a wife murderer, but it just so happens that he wrote this really amazing chapter that speaks to our problem, so that's why I'm kind of talking about him. Um, and he talks about these different temporalities, he doesn't talk about it in the context of um, in the context of the apocalypse, he talks about it in the context of uh, Marxist revolution, um, but I think it can be applicable here. Uh, so he says that basically when we think about the different timelines, what happens is that we have to understand them in relation to one another and in relation to a totality that what they make up, right? So different timelines uh, that happen in a society, for example, uh, create a whole. Um, but despite the fact that they create a whole, uh, they are dislocated and non-contemporaneous, right? So this is a technical way of basically saying that they're not identical. Uh, so these timelines are not part of one big timeline of the totality, but they have very different structure. So uh, one way in which they're not identical can be understood in terms of an analogy with uh, film. So when you have a film, um, and you do a zoom in, and like, you know, it's like an intense scene when you have two people talking to one another, you see very different things uh, within the close-up than if you zoom out and look at like a huge scene with a battle or something, right? There's a very different things show up and very, very different things uh, can be visible then. So for some people, this means that there is a huge difference between doing history as a micro-history, which basically means studying sort of individual characters in the context, and doing history in terms of sort of these big historical events. So what this basically means in terms of our timelines is that when I zoom in here, very different things are going to show up to me than if I zoom in here. And I think it's kind of obvious, right? Like, I mean, in some ways, um, when you think about it, I mean, I get really pissed off when I try to, you know, I wait for a bus, and I just see the bus, like, oh, I don't wait for it. I try to get the bus, and the bus is just 
you know, getting up. And I'm like, oh my god, it's so annoying. And it's like kind of an end of the world in some ways, for me at least, because I'm petty like this, like, oh my god, this is terrible. But from a historical point of view, this is completely irrelevant, right? Like no one cares about the fact that my bus is no, the, no longer there and I have to walk now. Um, so that's the sort of stuff that I'm talking about here. Uh, that sometimes, you know, what we experience as the end of the world in, in a context of history doesn't really mean much. And equally, there could be a historical event uh, that is massive um, that could be kind of called the end of the world, which might not have as much of an impact on you for various reasons. So that's the first uh, way in which these timelines that make up this totality can be different. The second one is that they actually can be placed in a different place temporally. Right, so you can feel ahead of your time, for example, if you feel like you're a genius and you've got things to offer and no one recognizes you, your society is not ready for the things you have to offer, you will feel ahead of the time, uh, you are beyond everyone else, but equally you can, feel, you can feel behind the times. I mean, I feel like this when it comes to TikTok, uh, I, I don't understand TikTok, I know it's there, I know what it is, uh, I mean, do I know it? I don't even know what it is, I mean, it is a thing, um, but... You know, it makes me feel like I'm not, you know, I'm not in touch with what's really going on, and I'm kind of behind the time, I'm lagging, right? So there is a way in which these different timelines, and by timelines here I basically mean my experience versus the experience of history, or versus history, is not in sync, right? I'm behind now, history is moving forward, I'm kind of staying behind. Um, we can also think about, you know, people who, uh, like, I don't know, I'm not comparing myself to this person, but like, you know, I was thinking about a, a partisan in a forest, continues to fight, because they think the war is, keeps going on, but actually the war has been over for two years. Right? So there's a sense in which history and, um, and the individual are out of sync. So what I'm trying to say here is that this totality uh, that I'm talking about is sort of, you know, you've got these different timelines, but they're not, they're not part of one big timeline. And the reason why this is important, I mean, you don't really care about this too much, but I think it's massively important because if they were to come together in one timeline, we would recreate the same problem we had at the beginning, namely one single timeline leading towards an end, which is bad because it creates a false sense of universalism. So to avoid that, we need to split the different timelines. Not only that, but according to Althusser, this way of thinking allows us to be truly revolutionary. Now, whether he's right or not, I'm not sure, but what he does talk about, um, again, a bit of a digression, uh, but he talks about his example is the Russian Revolution. So he's saying, how is it possible that the Russian Revolution, you know, and obviously you know this classic problem, I'm sure, maybe you don't, I'm not sure, but anyway, it's a classic problem within Marxist literature, namely that Marx is saying that the, the communist revolution can only happen in an industrially developed country, and then Russian Revolution happened in countries that were not industrially developed, like Russia, Cuba, and China, we actually had a huge peasant population and were not industrialized. So Marx has a problem here because obviously Marx is believing in Marx and turns out history is proving Marx wrong. Not only is history proving Marx wrong, but is doing that in the name of Marx. There are Marxist revolutions. So Althusser is struggling with this issue. How could it be that Marx is wrong about this because he has to be right about everything, right? And so the way he thinks about it is he thinks about it in terms of these different timelines. So he's saying that politics ideology and economy in Russia were operating on a different pace. Economy was lagging behind, but politics was way forward. And because politics was way forward, it was able to anticipate certain developments and then create a revolutionary situation and then push it through revolution into communism. And that's basically the idea. So he's trying to think about it politically. And I think that's relevant in terms of thinking about uh, climate change as well. So, just to sum up this sort of stuff about totality, I, 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 now that I kind of talk to you, I realize how uh, abstract it all sounds. But I promise you, it's super relevant because it's, it sounds abstract, but it's all about how we think about what's going on around us. Um, and so in terms of these different timelines, as I said, the problem was the single um, line going towards an end, which creates this false universalism. But if we have... Uh, multiple timelines, he's splitting the single timeline. If these timelines are, um, uh, are split, then we can account for differentiated ends of the world. They will be different in terms of their content and different in terms of the temporal spot as well. So we can account for this differentiation of climate crisis with that model. And also, um, because they belong within the totality, 
we can think about global effects of imperialism, capitalism, and so on, without having to be just localized. So we can actually think about it as a whole and how they all fit together. So we avoid um, false universalism, but instead we think about this totality of differentiate, differentiated climate crisis. Okay, so I'm gonna, uh, yeah, all right. So I've got just a very quick objection to my view. I've got lots of objections to my view. I can talk about it in the Q&A, but I just picked one of them. So the first problem is that, I mean, if you're a philosopher, people tell you, you know, you have to have a coherent answer. And what I presented to you are two answers to two problems which doesn't seem to cohere. Because on the one hand, I'm telling you, the solution is a spiral timeline. On the other hand, I'm telling you, the solution is a non-contemporaneous totality. But these two things are very different. The spiral timeline, timeline is trying to capture history and time and movement in the process as it sort of unravels in a very strange way. Um, whereas the totality uh, allows us to think about time almost ahistorically, right? We kind of freeze it in time and we look at different timelines and how they relate to one another. So it's a very different way of representing history. So they seem to be, so the sort of eco-eschatological uh, way of thinking about history I'm trying to propose seem to be committed to two irreconcilable ways of uh, modeling history and modeling time. Um, but I actually think that's not the case because we can superimpose them on one another. So we can think about this totality as made up of individual timelines that are structured as a spiral, and as a result of that we can have the sense of a synchronic totality with diachronic processes or a static picture that has um, active elements in it, basically. That's what I'm trying to say. And the reason why I think it's important um, is because, and this goes back to, I think, the political, well, that's what I hope it's, it's doing, uh, that it has some sort of a political import. So from a political point of view, and this is where uh, I think what's happening is actually not as abstract as it may seem, although it may seem very abstract, is that when we start thinking about the climate crisis as um, in, in these two different ways, we will be able to think about our tactics, namely short-term political goals, and our strategy, namely global long-term goal as well. Because the first model, the spiral model, allows us to devise individual tactics, right? So we think about individual timelines, uh, you know, what's happening here, what's happening there, what's happening with this person, what's happening with this community, and think about how to address that particular localized problem. But this meta-perspective opened up by the totality allows us to think about how to change the whole of the historical situation in such a way that this uh, historical situation can, yeah, can be uh, made better. And I think that's it. Okay, thank you. Yeah.